Good evening, everybody. You can open up your Bible to the book of Philippians chapter 4, the book of Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to start reading in verse 4. We're in the middle of a series right now called The Fight of Faith, God's Promises for Life's Problems. So what we're doing every single week is we are just taking a common problem that we experience in our Christian life, and we're seeing how God's word and God's promises answers those problems that we experience. And we're trying really to to get into the nitty gritty of our life. We're trying to see, okay, how when I leave this room can I take this passage of scripture and employ it in my life? How can I actually make it work in my life so I can start growing in some of these areas? Because honestly, the things that we're talking about over the next uh, several weeks and the ones we've talked about even before this are just common problems that you face in the Christian life. No one uh, is like the one person that really, really struggles with it. Uh, Some of us struggle with it more than others, but it's just common struggles of the Christian life. And so this is a really exciting time for us to see how God's word is relevant for every area of our life and even the problems that we experience in our life as well. So let's read Philippians chapter four, starting in verse four, and we'll read through verse seven. Here's what it says. Rejoice in the Lord, always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we look at your word right now, that your word would demonstrate itself as relevant for our lives. Lord, you say that your word is able to equip us for every good work, that we have everything we need in your word for life and for godliness. And so, Father, I pray right now that as we look at Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, that you would take this passage and you would uh, show in great power that we can trust you with the things that we're anxious about. We pray that you would do these things in Jesus' name, amen. So I want you to think for a minute with me about all the things that you and I don't know, okay? Think about all the things that we do not know together. I just, I just wrote down a, a list of things that we could think about. Uh, we do not know the weather tomorrow, especially this time of year in Florida. You just don't know the weather the next day. Uh, We do not know the results of the election in November. We do not know the next time our AC is going to break in our house or in our car. Some of you have had painful experiences of that this summer. We don't know if the economy is going to fully recover as it's kind of tanked in the middle of this pandemic. We don't know what other people are thinking right now in this room. You can look around at the other people in the room and say, I don't actually really know what's going on in your mind. I might think that I do. I don't know what you're thinking about me right now. You're actually all looking at me with really stone cold faces and I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know and you don't know if the virus is going to spike again. Everybody's got an opinion about the virus if you don't know. Everyone's got opinions on what's exactly happening. No one knows, no one knows. Uh, We don't know if we're going to get cancer one day. We don't know how long we're going to live. You don't know if your car is going to break down on the way home. Now, it's a great way to start a sermon. How does that make you feel right now? Think about all the things you don't know. And I just listed a a handful of things, but we could go on and on and on, all the things we don't know. How does that make you feel? The odds are, if you're anything like me, is you kind of don't like it. We don't like not knowing. We don't like the uncertainty. I know that because probably almost everybody in here with a smartphone has a weather app on their phone because you don't like not knowing what the weather is going to be tomorrow, do you? 
I remember last year when the, the hurricane was supposed to flatten our whole city, and uh, I realized about uh, two weeks into the four weeks of hurricane craziness for the first time as a Midwesterner that no one knows what's going on with hurricanes. We just watch the weather for a month and pretend that we do. We don't know. It's why, it's why we watch the news with regularity and read articles about the news. It's why we do routine maintenance on things in our house and in our car. It's why we do ultrasounds when we find out that we're pregnant. It's why we get MRIs. It's why we get yearly checkups. The, the, the bottom line is, is that you and I are people that like to know that everything is going to be okay. That's what we wanna know. Is, is everything gonna be, is everything gonna be all right? And I'll just be honest, if there is anything that the year 2020 has taught me, it's that everything can turn on its head really, really fast. Do you know what I'm talking about? We all had 2020 plans. I don't know if you made 2020 goals, churches all, even we did. We had our 2020 vision for what we're doing and, and where we're going. And all of those things just get turned on their heads, even when we take proper and appropriate steps to prepare, those things can just change really fast. So let me ask you again, how does that make you feel? If you're anything like me, that tempts you to be anxious. When we don't know things, when things are uncertain, it tempts us to feel anxiety. Some of the deepest struggles of my Life as a Christian have been struggles with the sin of anxiety. And uh, I speak to enough Christians every week to know that this is probably one of the most common struggles for the people in this room right now. You struggle with the sin of anxiety. And I imagine that I probably have shocked some of the people in this room by the fact that I called anxiety a sin because anxiety isn't thought of as a sin in our culture right now. We don't, we don't think of anxiety as disobedience to God. And the reason I call it a sin is not because I'm trying to pick on anybody, it's just because of what the Bible teaches about anxiety. So Jesus forbids us to be anxious. So this is in Matthew chapter six, verse 25. He says it very simply. He says, for this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life. Jesus says to his followers, you're not allowed to worry about your life. And that's really important. I, I want us to recognize that up front. For us to recognize up front that this is sinful to be anxious because it helps us understand why we should fight anxiety in our life. Most of us want anxiety out of our life because we just don't like it, right? It's, it's not a pleasant feeling for your heart to be racing, to have a pit in your stomach, to have your thoughts racing in your mind. We don't like that experience. But, but the reason we need to fight anxiety is not just because it's unpleasant. It's because it doesn't glorify God. That's the reason we fight anxiety as Christians. So this sermon isn't therapy. This sermon is a call for us to turn away from anxiety, the sin of anxiety, and turn toward God and glorify him with our life. We don't use God as a means to get the goal of an anxiety-free life. Rather, we fight anxiety and seek to be free from anxiety so that we can enjoy and trust and glorify God in our life. The motivation of our heart as we fight anxiety matters. We have to be motivated by the glory of God. So here's how I would define anxiety. Anxiety happens when we see life divorced from God's presence. So anxiety happens in my heart and in your heart when we see our life divorced from God's presence. Presence. What, it's when I look at all the uncertainties of my life and I say, God's not here. God's not there. God's not tending to that. I need to tend to that. I need to take care of that because it won't be okay if I don't think about it, if I don't work on it, if I don't talk about it, if I don't pay attention to it. It will not be okay, this uncertain thing, this thing I can't control. 
It's when we say to ourselves, I'm not going to be all right. And God's not here. And that begins to control our thoughts. It begins to control our emotions. It begins to control our decisions. This life divorced from the presence of God. And the reason I define it that way is because of the main truth that we see in Philippians chapter four, verses four through seven. And and this is the main truth I want us to see from the passage. It's this. Anxiety dies in God's presence. That, that's the main truth you see in Philippians chapter four. Anxiety dies in God's presence. Now, if that's true, if, if that's the point of the passage, if that's what Paul's saying, anxiety dies in God's presence, we need to figure out how to take all the stuff of our life that I'm anxious about, that you're anxious about, and to bring that into God's presence. To take these things that we feel like, oh, God's not paying attention to this, or I'm viewing this part of my life outside of who God is and what his promises are, and bring those things into his presence to get the proper biblical perspective on it. And so what Paul does in this passage is he provides us three instructions to help us bring our anxiety into the presence of God. Three instructions to help us bring our anxiety into the presence of God. So let's, let's look at them. Here's the first instruction. Paul tells us, number one, to abide in God's presence. Abide in God's presence. The fight of faith against anxiety begins before the bullets of life start whizzing by your head and the bombs start exploding and all the pressure of life starts coming at you. The fight of faith against anxiety actually begins in you daily abiding in God's presence as a believer. And that's how Paul envisions our life together in verses four and five. Just just notice a couple of things that he does in this passage. Notice that Paul says that we should rejoice in God's presence. Look at verse four. He says, rejoice in the Lord, always. Again, I will say rejoice. So what is rejoicing in the Lord? Rejoicing in the Lord means finding your joy, finding your stability in your life in the unchanging character of God and in the unchanging promises of God. That's where you find your stability and your joy and your certainty in the middle of instability and uncertainty. It's in God's character as it's revealed in his word and in his promises which never change. So the roots of your heart are anchored, to mix metaphors, in God's unchanging character when everything else is changing all around you. So it's anchored in the one that never ever changes. And that's why Paul says this crazy thing. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. How can you tell somebody to rejoice always? The only way you can tell someone to rejoice always is if the object of their joy is unchanging. That's what he's saying. He's saying you rejoice in the Lord and you can rejoice always. You can always have something to rejoice in. And he envisions us as believers stewing over and meditating on and calling to mind and thinking about in our daily lives. Okay, who is God? Let me, let me think about who God is right now. Let me think about what he says about this thing right now. And Paul says that produces joy. You rejoice in him. Then Paul also says that we don't just rejoice in God's presence, who God is, what he promises, but we also display God's presence. Notice that in verse five. He says, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. So when you're rejoicing in God, when you're saying, man, I'm just, I'm just thinking about who God is right now. Life is stressful. Things are changing. But I know who God is right now in this moment, and I also know what God says right now in this moment, so I'm gonna have joy in the middle of this moment. It doesn't mean it's not hard. It doesn't mean it's not stressful, but I can have a stable joy right now. And when your joy is rooted in God, you stop clamoring around. You stop fretting. 
You stop racing in your mind and in your heart. You stop wringing your hands and wondering, am I gonna be okay? How can I make sure that this situation is okay? What do I need to think? What do I need to say? What do I need to do? What do I need to look up? How can I make this work? Will this be okay? And we listen to God's promises. And we remember who he's revealed himself to be in his word. And we display the joy of God's presence to other people. Paul says it produces a gentleness or a reasonableness in our hearts. People look at us and we have a gentle disposition. We're not clamoring, we're not fretting, we're not running all over the place in anxiety because our joy is rooted in God. We're not constantly trying to get ours in life because we have ours in Christ. And then finally, Paul says that we don't just need to display God's presence, we don't just need to rejoice in God's presence, but we also need to believe that God will be present. Look look at verse five. He just says these four words. The Lord is near. So rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. What Paul's saying is Jesus is coming soon. He's coming back and he's coming soon. And that's meant to comfort Christians and bring them perspective when they're feeling anxious. The Lord is near. He's closer to coming back today than he was yesterday. So you can rejoice as you remember that all the pressures of this world will one day be no more. And that's not just like a dream. It's not just like this mystical thing that we say to make ourselves feel better as Christians. No, 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 there will actually be a day when all of us are gonna be together and the whole world will be made new and Jesus will be there and there will be no sin and there will be no pain and there will be no tears and we're really as Christians supposed to think about that day and rejoice in it now knowing that it's near and that it's coming. And we can be gentle as we remember that because that's our hope and that doesn't change. My friend Brian he calls this the, uh, the one million year perspective. He says, he says, everything gets in perspective when you view it about a million years from now. That's what he says to me. It, it's this perspective that I, I feel the pain of this life, I feel the pressures of this life, I feel the anxieties of this life, but I'm gonna look at this through the filter of a million years from now. And what I will see a million years from now is that the suffering and the sorrows of this present time aren't worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed to me. And that produces joy in your heart. It produces joy. It doesn't mean that life isn't hard, but it means that we've got to discipline our minds, renew our minds, take our thoughts captive so that we view our life through the grid of God's presence with us in the future. Paul wants us to abide in God's presence. Do you see that? Rejoice in God's presence. Display God's presence to other people as you trust and you rejoice in him. He says, says, be in God's presence, abide in it, rejoice in the Lord. Let your gentleness be, be made known. Rejoice and believe that Jesus is coming back soon because he is. The most significant way that Paul is going to instruct us to abide in in God's presence is by the second instruction he gives us, which is what I want to turn to here. The second instruction he gives us is to talk in God's presence. Talk in God's presence. So number one, abide in God's presence. But number two, fight anxiety by talking in God's presence. What does anxiety sound like? What does it sound like in your head when you know I'm getting anxious about this? Here's how it sounds in my life. I'm just gonna invite you in to Spencer Harmon's inner dialogue on any given day of like family and pastoral ministry. So here you go, welcome into my life and into my thoughts and into my heart. These are real anxious thoughts I've had within the last like year or so, okay? Here's here's how it goes. The, the, The alarm rings way too early and I start, talking in my head. Here's how it sounds. Oh boy, I've got that meeting today. I wonder what they want to talk about. Are they upset? That would not be okay if they're upset. That could go really bad. You know what? If they're upset about this, then I could say that and then it'll be okay. Then another thought comes. Oh no, 
our van is doing that weird shifting thing that it did a couple years ago when the transmission went out. I just felt it. I hope my wife didn't feel that. I just felt it. It's, it's not shifting right again. And if the transmission goes out, that would eat into our savings and we will be way set back on our goals and then things will not be okay. This, this wouldn't be good. Then another thought comes. Oh no, we're running late. We're running late. We were all in a car and then my son decided that he needed a new diaper. Here we are. We're gonna be late. And, and, and right when we get in the car, he needs a new diaper. People are going to think that we're super sloppy and that we don't care about them and we're super late. How can I make sure that these people don't think bad about us? This is not good. We're not going to be okay. Another anxious thought. It's about to get real, real. Man, does this sermon on anxiety sound really insensitive? I mean, I just called anxiety a sin. I wonder what everybody's thinking. Am I nuancing this right? Do they understand that I know that these things are complex? I mean, I wonder what they're thinking right now. Ooh, man, that person's making a really strange face at me. I, is it gonna be, do I need to follow up with them after the sermon to make sure everything's okay? Do they understand me? Do they know that I get this and I know it's hard? And Am I being relatable? And I hope they understand that I'm not trying to be blah, blah, blah. Is this going to be okay? Am I gonna be okay? What do you think about me? Oh no, I got this pain in me. Am I sick? I just coughed. Do I have the virus? What's wrong with me? Am I going to be okay? My kids, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Am I going to be okay? You want to know what that sounds like? That sounds like prayer. That's what that sounds like, doesn't it? But I'm just praying to myself about my problems. I'm praying but I'm praying to Spencer Harmon about Spencer Harmon's problems. Anxiety is when you pray to yourself about problems you know you can't solve. So it's an endless cycle. So you start talking to yourself about the problems that you have, and as you're talking to yourself about the problems you have, you realize, I can't solve these problems that I have. I need to talk about it, so I'll talk about these problems that I have, but I can't solve these problems that I have. So I'll talk about it again, and I can't solve it. What do I do? This is why anxiety often feels like you can't control your thoughts because you're talking to the wrong person. We're talking to the wrong person. And Paul wants us to do something infinitely better. Look at verse six. Be anxious for nothing. That's a bold statement. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul looks at us and he says, don't pray to yourself about your anxiety. Pray to God. Don't talk to yourself about your anxiety. Talk to God. Paul wants us to pray about our problems as the main way you and I fight anxiety in our life. Notice how he wants us to pray. Let's just look closely at the text. So he says in verse six, be anxious for nothing. Now look at this phrase. But in everything, by prayer and supplication. Stop there. Did you notice that small phrase there? He says, he says, in everything by prayer. That's a powerful pra- phrase to think about. In everything in your life by prayer. Talk about everything. Is it a thing and are you in it? Pray. That's what Paul's saying. If it is a thing in your life, in everything, Do it by prayer. Be in it by prayer. Talk to God about everything. Talk to him about the meeting. Talk to him about the transmission in your car. Talk to him about being late to be with friends. Talk to him about what other people may or may not be thinking about you. Talk to him about my sermon, whether you like it or not. I'm talking to him about my sermon. Talk to God. Tell him what you're thinking. Tell him what you're feeling. And Paul says, make supplication. Paul says this another way at the end of the verse. So so look at the end of verse six. He says, let your requests be made known to God. That's supplication. So we take these concerns to God and we ask God to do things about them, 
to, to take care of them. So here's how, here's how it will go with these anxious thoughts I just told you about in my mind. Lord, you know what's gonna go, go on in that meeting that's gonna happen this afternoon. You know what's gonna happen in that meeting. You know what we're gonna talk about. So would you just help me honor you and whatever you got coming for me in this meeting right now? I, I don't know what's gonna happen, so you, you do, so this is all you. You gotta help me. Lord, you provided this van, van for us. And so you know what? If it busts again, you're gonna provide for us then too. So just, just help me to be a good steward of this thing no matter what happens. Lord, listen, we're late. You know about this diaper. You know about that, so would you just help me be patient? Would you help me to trust you that this is your plan right now for us today? Is for us to be 35 minutes late to wherever we're going. Would you just help me to trust you? Help me to love my family. Help me to trust you with my reputation. Lord, I'm, I'm sitting here in, in this, in this, on this stage and behind this pulpit, and I'm trying to be faithful to your word and be useful to your people, so help me just to focus on that right now and not focus on what people are thinking about this sermon. One of the most powerful thoughts you can think in your mind when anxious thoughts come in is this. God knows. God knows about that. God knows about that. That'd be a great thing for us just to say to each other. When we talk about problems in our life, not, not to dismiss it, not to go deeper in the problems, but to be like, you know what? God knows about this thing that we're talking about that we can't figure out. God knows about it and he cares about it. I'm making my request known to him and I'll tell you what, God's on it. He is on it. He cares about this problem. I don't have to fret over this. I don't have to obsess over this. I don't have to run over every possible contingent plan in my mind about this. God knows about it. But notice, Paul takes one more step here in this, in this verse six. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. So our prayers are punctuated with thanksgiving. I think Paul puts here because he wants this to be an expression of trust. It's a heart that prays with thankfulness. It means that as I'm asking things of God, as I'm making my requests known to God, I'm believing, like God, I just wanna thank you because you know what I need. I'm asking for a specific thing here, but I thank you that you're a good God you know exactly what I need in this circumstance and you're gonna do the thing that's best for me. I'm reminding myself of who you are. I'm thanking you for who you are. I'm reminding myself of your promises. I'm thanking you for your promises. And when we do that, it leads to this final instruction that Paul gives us. The final instruction that Paul gives us to bring our anxiety into the presence of God. Number three is rest in God's presence. Rest in God's presence. Abide in God's presence. Talk in God's presence. Rest in God's presence. So um, I don't know if any of you guys got in the same amount of trouble that I did, uh, but tax season was delayed this year because of COVID. Do you know about that? So it was delayed to like July 15th. Did anybody else get, well, you don't have to raise your hand, but you got to the week of July 15th and you were like, oh no, I waited to do my taxes. <laughs> Gail says yes. <laughs> um, it's good to know. Uh, I'm not alone. So I, I waited. I'm not much of a procrastinator, but there's just certain things like taxes that are very easy to just like punt down the field and punt down the field until that week comes. And so I did. I waited till the week they were due. And you want to know what? I was kind of burdened by it. I, it felt really complicated to me. I had all these like papers and, and things that I were like in this like drawer where we call our important paper drawer, which is just like a mess of important papers. And so I'm like sorting through these things the night before I'm supposed to go see the CPA. And um, so I go, I, I take my mess and I go to the CPA's office and I like plop down in this lady's chair and I just lay out my mess in front of this CPA and uh, I hand over the information and I, she fills out this form and she processes all of it and she's like, yeah, I'll just take care of it. And I was like, really? Okay, <laughs> great. You'll take care of this? And so uh, I got in my car and you want to know what happened in my heart? Peace. That's what happened in my heart. A bunch of peace came into my heart. I'm like driving home from the CPA's office. And I don't have to think about my taxes anymore. This is gonna be great. I don't, I don't know tax law. I don't want to know tax law. No one wants, well, some people, CPAs want to know tax law, but that's about it. And what I do know, I don't need to be doing on my own. 
about taxes. So I said to the CPA, I said, listen, this is all you. You just take all this mess. I'm just going to throw this into your pile. And you take this, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go home, and I'm not going to think about this. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rest in your knowledge of my mess and my taxes. I made the information known to her. She took care of it, and this piece was mine. And that's a really just silly picture of what's supposed to happen in our souls when we bring our anxiety, when we talk to God about our anxiety. Look at verse seven. So you start talking to God about your anxiety and here's the promise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So God's peace that surpasses comprehension doesn't mean that this like misty peace feeling comes when you pray and you're just like, wow, it's gone. And I don't even know how that happened. That's not really what he's referring to, that you like go brain dead and then you get peace spiritually. That's not what Paul's talking about. Keep the verse in context here, right? So verse six, Paul just says, pray, make the request known to God And then before that, he says, rejoice in God, abide in God's presence. The Lord's coming soon. Talk to God about your problems. He calls us to abide in God's presence every single day. And then he says, you'll experience peace that surpasses comprehension. One friend of mine, he observed, he's like, this doesn't say it bypasses our knowledge and comprehension. It says it surpasses our knowledge and comprehension. Paul is talking about a rest in God's presence that surpasses the details of your circumstances because you have handed over those details to God and you said, this is going into your pile, Lord. This, this mess is going into your problem, meaning the peace doesn't make sense based off the external situation of the circumstance. Imagine you had never met a CPA before. And, and, and you were like, what do you mean you're not thinking about your taxes anymore? You just go over to some random lady and go into a room and hand her all the most important files that you have? How do you know she's really gonna take care of it? How do you know that she's not gonna steal your identity? How do you know that she's actually the real deal? How do you know that she's gonna do it better than you do it? You should be more worried. You should be upset. I would say, give me a break. Don't you know what CPAs do? This is like what their favorite thing in the world is to do. You don't know who this person is. I don't need to fret. This is how our life is supposed to be with the Lord. In the same way that I don't need to stand over the CPA's shoulder and monitor her as she's like looking at my W-2, making sure she's doing everything correctly, God doesn't need us monitoring him with the uncertainties of our life, obsessing over every detail. He wants us to trust him and to experience and receive his peace through prayer. When we pray, we're not just doing a ritual to say I prayed so that way I can really get down to business and start worrying. No, we we really are unburdening ourselves, And we're saying, Lord, this is you. I don't know how to figure this out. You have to take this. So we rejoice and who God is and what he's promised. We pray thankfully to God about the concerns that we have. And then we rest that God has a greater knowledge of where we're at than we do and of our situation and he can handle the situation better than we can. So that's why it guards our minds. God's knowledge exceeds our own knowledge and so our minds can be guarded. God has more power than we do over the situation and so we can rest and our hearts can be guarded. We know that God's thinking about our situation. We know that God's powerful in this situation. And we say, I can't manage all the unknowns of my life, so you take them now, Lord. So as always, I, I wanna just end our time by, by just making this really nitty-gritty practical. How can this be useful tomorrow when you wake up and you're, I don't know about you, but like all my anxious thoughts, I like wake up, I get in the shower, and then your mind just starts racing about your day and what's gonna happen and what's gonna go on and what's happening here, what's happening there. So how does this get useful when you're having your shower thoughts, okay? How does this, how does this get useful to you? Well, let me, let me just give you the one thought I've promised you, the one thought you can bring to mind that would help you. So the one thought is turn anxiety into thankful prayer. So when you feel anxious, Tomorrow morning, remember, 
if you remember anything from this sermon that I said to you, turn anxiety into thankful prayer. And you can remember that. You feel anxious? Okay, I need to turn this into thankful prayer. God, help me. That's what I want you to remember next time you feel anxious. Now let me just give you a, a couple of suggestions on how you can do this, and then we'll re wrap up. Number one, interrogate your anxiety. Interrogate your anxiety. Ask yourself questions. This is the only type of talking to yourself that you should do at, about anxiety. Ask yourself, what, why, why do I believe I'm not gonna be okay? What about this situation makes me think that I'm not gonna be okay? Why? Try to understand what has gotten bigger than God in my life. Something has gotten bigger than God in my life because I think God's not here and God can't handle it. What's gotten bigger than God in my life? Ask yourself, why am I anxious? Interrogate it. Where do you think God isn't present in your life? Those are typically the areas where we get most anxious. And you say to yourself, how can I apply the promises of God to this area of anxiety tomorrow morning? How can you take Philippians 4, open up your Bible and say, I'm gonna apply this to this passage. I'm gonna make this anxious thought, like we talked about in our first week, submit and bow the knee to Jesus. I'm gonna make war on this thought. Anxiety has a root, let's find it. Ask another Christian to come alongside you. Hey, can we just talk about this? I just want to talk about this area where I'm always anxious. Number two, pray about everything. Pray about everything. Paul says, do not be anxious, but in everything by prayer. So pray about air conditioners, pray about cancer, pray about strained relationships, pray about your money, pray about stressful meetings. Make your requests known to God. Don't just keep them in your head. Make them known to God. Oftentimes I pray out loud in the car because I gotta get it out to the Lord. Make your requests known to God and then believe that he knows about it. Believe that he knows about it. When you think an anxious thought, say, that's my prompt to pray. Let's train our spiritual reflexes. I'm anxious, I'm gonna pray. I'm anxious, I'm gonna pray. And every time I feel anxious, I'm gonna pray. Even if I pray about the same thing 82 times in a day, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pray. Pray to God, trusting he'll act on your behalf. Number three, conduct the one million year test. Conduct the one million year test on your anxiety. He wants, God, God wants you to remember that Jesus is near. That doesn't make you ignore pain. It doesn't mean that the stress isn't real, it, but it does make us look at it differently. Romans 5.3 says that we rejoice in suffering, not because we love pain, but because we know that a million years from now, our deepest anxieties are going to be feathers in eternity. And we rejoice in that. We rejoice that we will experience joy and relief in the presence of God. Last one, number five, cultivate thanksgiving through remembering. Cultivate thanksgiving through remembering. Notice the assumptions that Paul has in verses four through seven. Paul assumes that God's presence is a safe place to be. Isn't that interesting? He assumes that the nearness of the Lord is good news for people like us. Paul assumes that we can just ask God for whatever. Paul assumes that God's peace is something that people like you and me have access to. How in the world can you assume that? How can you assume that sinful people like you and me can feel safe in God's presence? God is really holy. And you and I are very sinful. We struggle to trust him with transmissions and cars and being late. We, we struggle to trust him. And God can't be near sinful people like us. How in the world could people like us say, this is really good news, that God wants us to be near to him and he wants us to talk to him and he wants us to bring things into his presence and abide there. How's that good news? Let me tell you how it's good news. Ephesians 2.13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Jesus Christ earned our place in the presence of God. We have access to God's presence because we believers, those who have repented and believed, we are righteous. We are really righteous in God's sight. When God looks at Christians, 
he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what he sees. So that God's presence becomes this delightful place that we can just boldly enter into. We can come into and we can ask for things and we can know I belong here. I belong here not because I'm righteous in myself, not because I never sin. I belong here because I'm with Jesus. This isn't about what I've done. This is about who I know. I'm with him, and that's why I belong here. His blood has brought me near. He rose and ascended, and now he intercedes for us so that way people who have been struggling and faltering all day long who come to God at the end of the day and say, Lord, I blew it today. I'm trusting in Jesus. You can go really boldly into his presence and pray about your sore throat that you're anxious about. That's amazing. Only a savior like Jesus could do that for people like you and me. And that cultivates thanksgiving in your heart. In the middle of the anxiety, it lets you know that the thing you should be most anxious about, judgment day, your sin before a holy God, my sin before a holy God, the thing that we should be most anxious about has been smashed forever at the foot of the cross and at the empty tomb. No matter what happens, everything is going to be eternally okay. (laughs) So let's breathe. Everything's gonna be okay. It doesn't mean you're not gonna suffer, but everything will be eternally okay. Way better than okay. Perfect. Forever. And remember that. Meditate on that. Let that stir your heart to abide in his presence, to talk in his presence, and to rest in his presence. Anxiety dies in the presence of God.